So welcome everybody. What we're going to be doing is going through some basics of reform theology. Basics of uh, reform theology. So this might be review for you, but I suspect that it's, it's going to be review that will be still very helpful. I always enjoy going back over this material, um, even after teaching it, of course, because these are things that, that tend to leak out of us. And um, I think it's very exciting to, to, to study the Word of God standing on the shoulders, as it were, of, of generations and generations and generations of, of saints and thinkers that have come before us. Um, and utilizing the help of the Reformed tradition in, in understanding the Word of God. And so that's what we're going to seek to be doing. And I want us to start this morning um, by reading Genesis chapter 15. This will be key to our, our first lesson this morning. So let's start by hearing God's Word, Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he took him and he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number him. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell on him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace." You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadomites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God's word. The reason I want us to start with uh, this passage of scripture is because it records for us a covenant-making ceremony. And we want to start off today by... Uh, recognizing that Christianity is a covenantal religion. Christianity is a, a covenantal religion. And I want us to, to move into to seeing what that means uh, by thinking about the way a lot of people perceive the Christian faith uh, in our time, in, in our country. A lot of people perceive the Christian faith along the lines of a relationship, not a religion. In fact, you can, you can hear that phrase. When people describe Christianity, they'll, they'll use the phrase, it's a relationship, not a religion. And there's, there's great intention behind that. And, and in fact, the, the, that, that carries some truth. 
Because what they're intending by saying it's a relationship, not a religion, is they're intending to say that Christianity is unlike every other religion in the world. And it's not based on works. It's not simply about us carrying on certain ceremonies to please the deity and by those ceremonies gaining acceptance with him. There's an intimacy. There's a relational aspect of Christianity that is not found in in other religions. But there's some problems with with, uh, thinking along those lines. And the first problem, of course, is that Christianity is in fact a religion right? It is, in fact, a religion. In fact, when we think about the kind of relationship that that it it involves, we would say, well, it's a religious relationship because it's a relationship between us and God. It's not a relationship between equals. So there's there's something about the relationship that we we have with God that, that is religious in character because it has to do with our relationship with God Almighty. But the other problem that goes along with thinking about Christianity in those terms as a a relationship, not a religion, is that very often if we think in those terms, we'd never really define the nature of the relationship. It never really gets nailed down and defined. So you say, well, what kind of relationship is it? Well, you know, it's, it's this loving r- r- relationship. Okay, yeah, but, but like, tell me more about that. Like, how do you know that, that God loves you, and how do you express your love with God? And, and what might end the relationship? What, what if a threat to the relationship comes along might, might end it? Because I got to say, I've been in some relationships before, some pretty serious relationships, you know, at least for like a 10th grader. And uh, turns out, although I took it very seriously at the time, right, a few months later, it, it, it was gone. Now, this is something that we have to avoid Uh, at all costs in some sense, because it leads into all kinds of bondage. When we are not absolutely clear about the nature of our relationship with Almighty God, we end up inadvertently making it a relationship that depends on us in in very significant and serious ways. So we end up thinking, well, okay, this relationship Since it's not nailed down, I've got to to pursue its maintenance, and I've got to to keep it strong. And if I don't do what's necessary in this relationship, then it's going to fall apart. But it gets worse than that because we not only take on the burden of maintaining the relationship ourselves, because it's not nailed down and defined, we're not quite sure how to go about maintaining the relationship. We're not sure exactly what it means to keep the relationship healthy. And so, you know, you try different things. So, you know, people ask some Christians, uh, how are you doing in your walk with the Lord? Very good question to ask. How are you doing in your walk with the Lord? Well, I, g- I guess it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling uh, a, a little bit. Wow, man, it sounds like that relationship is not very healthy at all. You, you really should, should do something. Right? I mean, living life uncertain about the health of your relationship with God, not a good thing at all. But a lot of people spirit experience significant amount of time in that spiritual condition, just not sure about how healthy their relationship is with God. That's a serious problem. So what are you going to do about it? Well, that's the thing. I'm not exactly sure what to do about it. Well, you should try spiritual journaling. You should go on a pilgrimage right? I bought this icon off the internet, and at first it seems a little bit goofy, but when I use this icon in prayer, wow, I really feel a lot of stuff. The person is sitting there going, okay, I guess I'll try it. You're having to search for some sort of spiritual technology that will enable your relationship with God to be strong. You're having to figure it out yourself like you would in a immature romantic relationship, right? I got to figure out how to make this thing work. This is a massive problem because not only does it put this burden of works upon us, 
but it is utterly and completely unbiblical. God has never, ever, ever been ambiguous about the nature of his relationship with humans. And so if we go back into the garden, and in the garden, God was requiring obedience, right? There was not, it was a, not a relationship uh, centered around the cross of Jesus Christ, right? Because Adam and Eve had not yet fallen into sin. So it was a relationship that, whose help was maintained on the basis of their obedience, right? But they weren't sitting around going, man, I wonder what's going to count as obedience. And I wonder what will happen if we disobey. No, God made it very, very clear. Here's what I'm requiring of you. It was nailed down. It was defined. It was clear. So God has never been in a relationship with humans where the nature of that relationship has been ambiguous. He's always nailed it down. Always nailed it down. And the way he's nailed it down is by means of covenants. Covenants. So in this uh, class, uh, we're going to be talking about covenants over and over and over again. Because a covenant is what the Bible uh, uses to nail down and define our relationship with God. Now, the word covenant, as we use it in the Bible, goes back to ancient Near Eastern um, uh, documents and practices. And really what the word covenant means is an official bond. When you think of covenant, you need to think official bond. One of my professors used to describe it as an official bond or disposition between two or more parties. In other words, it's a relationship that's been nailed down. It's an, a, a relationship that that has an official character and an official um, uh, uh, set of rules and standards that go along with it. So we can think of what's a very significant covenant in, uh, in our lives. You've all been to covenant-making ceremonies of this type. Marriage, right? In fact, that's the only covenant-making ceremonies that a lot of people have been to if they've never been to a church service. Now, think about marriage. Is it a relationship? Absolutely. And so is there a lot of personal and intimate and, and mysterious, you know, feelings? I'm trying to be romantic and I'm falling short. <laughs> In other words, it's not just like this sort of legal thing. Uh, or if it is just this sort of legal thing, it's a very sad situation. It's not meant to be just this sort of, uh, I don't, why are you upset, dear? I've fulfilled my part of the bargain, you know. It's not meant to be that. It's meant to be very personal, very, very intimate. And yet, it's not just personal and intimate, is it? It's very nailed down and official. And those two things actually go together and help each other. They're not in competition with each other. The fact that it is nailed down and the type of relationship it is is well-defined and the expectations that are established in the relationship, I'm giving my whole self to you and only to you. You're giving your home, whole self to me and only, you mean to, to work for each other? No, it's not. This is not a business contract. No, we're talking about the, the intimacy of a marriage relationship and the building of a family and all my property that belongs to me. It's all nailed down, Right? I'm doing that for you and you're doing that for me. That only increases the environment where the kind of mysterious, romantic, personal attachment can, can grow. And it grows and it, and it hangs on and it survives times of great, great drought, right? When the feelings are, are not bubbling up and, and overflowing. I'm looking at Alex and Mary and they've not yet experienced anything but bliss. And we all just tell them, right? Oh, you wait. <laughs> you wait. Marriages hit those rough patches, but what, what grows through the rough patch? What sustains through the rough patch? The fact that we're not dating. This isn't just as long as we like each other. This has been nailed down. It's official. 
I have officially given myself to you. There's a legal element to it. You have officially given yourself to me. We are committed. So we're going to work through this. We're going to work through this. Our relationship with God is very similar. In fact, the Bible often describes God's relationship with his people with the analogy of a marriage. And one of the reasons he does that is because there's this intimate, beautiful, I won't say romantic, but but uh, uh, there's an intimate side of it where we are giving our whole self to him in love, and he is giving his whole self to us in love. It goes way beyond a contract, right, in character. But at the same time, that intimate relational uh, aspect takes place within a legal framework. It is not just a bond. It is an official bond, And so covenant becomes very important in Scripture in order for us to understand how, what our relationship with God is like. So we're not, we're not floundering all over the place, uncertain about how healthy it might be or or what's expected of us or what we can expect of Him. Have you ever been hesitant to ask God for something? Right? Been hesitant to ask God for something? I don't know if I really deserve that. Do I have the right to to, to demand that kind of thing? If you're married, have you ever been hesitant to ask your spouse for something? We make the opposite mistake, right? But we, you better give me, you better give me that. And we may ask it, I'm only half joking. Um, And if you're not married yet, you're like, wow, this marriage thing sounds rough. I don't know. (laughs) But, But my point is it it survives the rough things because of the covenantal aspect. But in our marriage relationships, we ask things of our spouse, and we ask with a certain amount of expectation and even, dare I say it, with a certain amount of demand, right? You You need to fulfill your part of this relationship because you promised on our wedding day. God says, I've made promises to you. And it's not like a middle schooler in a little romantic fling. It's much more like marriage. It is official. A bond has been established. There are things you can count on. And there are things I expect of you. To understand our relationship with God, we've got to see the covenantal nature of it. And this is brought out in Scripture. We could even say that the Bible is all structured around covenants. It's all structured around covenants. So you notice we read from Genesis 15. This is not the first covenant in the Bible, but it's a very important foundational covenant. And we notice in Genesis 15 some odd things occurring. What were some of the odd things that, that we read about? Well, the oddest, the first odd thing for us anyway would be God has uh, Abram take all these animals and chop them in half and, and separate them, right? And then next, the odd thing is he's put into a deep trance, and then God uh, characterized uh, in the vision as a flaming torch in a, in, a, in a pot, smoking pot, passes through these animals. That was, in the ancient world, something that they would have quickly understood. What was happening was a covenant was being made, and in the ancient world, animals would be cut into, and they would be separated, and those making the covenant, those establishing this official bond, this official relationship, would pass through the halves of the animals, and they would say, essentially, if I break my part of the covenant, may I be like these animals. So, you know, it's taking, uh, it's taking um, uh, an oath at very extreme level. What's the one that the, we used to use as kids? Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. You know, that was just thrown around like casually as kids, but oh, I'm serious, Billy. Like, this, this, this is how real I am. Well, they took it to a next level in the ancient world. They actually cut the animals in half, and they were very serious. And so uh, treaties between nations were made in this manner. And God comes along to Abraham, whom he'd already made promises to, 
And Abraham, who responds to, God, how do I know? How do I know that that your promises are going to be fulfilled? Your promises that I'm going to have a lot of kids are are, going to be fulfilled. Can you give me some assurance? And God responds to him exactly according to what Abram was asking for. God says, okay, let's not leave this at all ambiguous. Let's establish it by way of covenant. And he tells Abram to set up the ceremony. Abram sets up the ceremony. Now, the twist with how God makes this covenant with Abram is instead of God and Abram walking through the pieces, or what could have also been done, just the lesser person in the arrangement, Abram walked through the pieces. Abram is put to sleep by God. He is removed from taking action in this oath-making ceremony. He just witnesses God making the oath to him, and God takes on both parts of the covenant as a, a flaming torch, as a smoking pot, and God walks through the pieces, and God announces the promises to Abraham. I'm going to do this. It's an official bond. Whether it costs me my life, I'm going to make sure I fulfill my promises to you. Now, wonderfully, we know how this points to the gospel, right? Because it did cost God his life. He was faithful even unto death to carry out his good, his good promises. So this one central, just one of them, but one of the central covenants in the Bible, way back in Genesis 15, is an example of God establishing a covenant and the rest of of the story of the Bible is fixed on that covenant. Everything you read from Genesis 15 on, every single thing is done in relation to this covenant. Now, there are other covenants made. There are are other covenants that occur, but all of it is structured, built on this covenant and other covenants. The entire Bible fits together in this way. But let me just prove this to you one more time uh, in, in one other way. If you flip to Hebrews chapter 8, we'll see how important reading the Bible according to its, we could say, covenant scaffolding, right? Everything fitting together on the frame of the covenants, that's demonstrated for us implicitly in Hebrews chapter 8. And in Hebrews 8, the author is talking about the fact that Jesus is the perfect high priest. He's the perfect high priest. And in the process of explaining why Jesus is a better priest, he talks about some covenants. And so let's jump into that, uh, beginning at verse 6. And just, we're not going to try to unpack the whole passage. I just want you to notice a couple things that are, are presented here. Verse 6, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it, the covenant he mediates, is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant, and he's pointing back to a covenant that was made in the Old Testament under Moses, if that first covenant had been faultless, now just real quick here, he means first not in an absolute sense, like it's the first covenant ever made, but first in a relative sense, as in the, the first one I'm talking about in relation to the second one I'm about to, to, to reverence, okay? Just, just take note of that. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, and he quotes from Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, there is a lot of important theology in that passage. What I want us to notice just for now is how the author who, of Hebrews sees the Scriptures as structured according to these covenants. He's talking about the work of Christ, and he's talking about how perfect the work of Christ is. And to explain how perfect the work of Christ is, he can't help but, but talk about it in terms of covenants that have been made. And he refers back to a, a major covenant in the Old Testament that God made through Moses with the people of Israel. And it was a covenant that, that depended in, in part on them being obedient. But they failed. And, and, the, and the author says, and the author says, yeah, look what God did. In response to their failure, he promises a better covenant. A covenant not dependent on us to obey at all, a covenant that is, is fulfilled with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about what's going on there. He's, we've already seen covenant established with Abraham, right? We, we see then that very important to understand everything that's happening with the nation of Israel under Moses is this covenant that the author of Hebrews talks about. We see that the promises in the prophets Jeremiah, to understand what's going on there. You have to understand its promises in terms of covenant. To understand the work of Christ and what he fulfills. The end of the story of the Bible, you have to understand it in terms of covenant. It all fits together as the story of God making covenant with his people. Different covenants, but all leading up to the fulfillment in the covenant that he has made with us in Jesus Christ. Okay, so again, a lot of theology in that passage. I just wanted you to, to recognize the Bible reads itself according to the covenants. And what a wonderful blessing this is. Because as I said a few minutes ago, as I said at the start, it means that we don't have to wonder about our relationship with God. It means we don't have to wonder about our relationship with God. He's nailed it down. He's made it official in terms, of, in terms of covenant. Okay, so Christianity is a covenantal religion. And as we dig into the Bible, we understand better and better the nature of our relationship uh, with God in Christ Jesus. We're not left to wonder. We're not left to, to wander. So now I'd like us to transition into thinking about the Bible as the book of the covenant, okay? Because I've been talking to you about Christianity as a covenantal religion, and what have I used to prove that it's a covenantal religion, a religion that God establishes with us in an official way? I've been using the Bible, right? Well, that assumes some things about the Bible that we want to make clear right now, and this is very foundational, in order to, uh, um, to know God, he has to have spoken to us. And there's two different ways that God speaks to us. Does anyone know the first way we might say that God, that God speaks to us? Anyone? Now, this is a setup kind of because, you know, if you, if you raise your hand and you say something crazy, you know, like, well, one time my dog... Is that where you're going, Henry? <laughs> there, I, was, I, was, I, was, I heard a voice in the shower, and it was Tom Brokaw, but that's not important. Okay, the first way God speaks to us is actually, I was not thinking of the Bible. I was thinking that's the second way. But the first way would be through nature, right? So we read in the Bible that God uh, declares his glory in the works of his hand. So you think back to, to Psalm uh, 19 and, and Psalm 119. 
and you think of Romans 1, where we are told that everyone knows at a very important level that, that God is, right? Everyone has been told that there is a God and, and, and they're not him, right? Everyone's been told that. Not that they listen, not that they believe it, but they've been told that because creation and the human conscience announces it. And we call this general revelation, general revelation. We call it general revelation because it's just a part of creation and it's announced to everyone. No one ever escapes having this announcement made to them. But there are great limits to general revelation. If you look out on creation, you are being told uh, that there is a God and that he is great. But you're not being told anything about Jesus, right? You're not being told anything about Jesus, so God not only has announces things according to what we would call general revelation, the witness of nature, he also reveals by way of what we would call special revelation. Not general, but special. And in different times and seasons, God has spoken directly to people. But now, what God announces to us in this special way about his special message of special grace in Jesus Christ is in the word of God, the Bible. And so we want to talk about the characteristics of the Bible because it reveals in a very special way this special knowledge of covenant with God, the covenant that we are in with God. So we're going to talk about the Bible According to, let me see if I can count them here. One, two, three, four, five, six characteristics, okay? We're going to hit this uh, kind of fast. These are all very important. We're going to hit them kind of fast, but they're all very important. The first thing that the Bible is, is that it is authoritative. The Bible is authoritative, it's the authoritative book of the covenant because by it, by the Bible, God constitutes us as his people. So you could think of it in, in, in similar fashion if we continue the marriage analogy. You could think of it in some ways as uh, kind of like the, the marriage license. The marriage license authoritatively establishes you, uh, proves that, that, that you're, you're married. Or even before that, we could think of it as the announcement that the, the minister makes when he's actually marrying you. This is a great privilege that I have as a, as a pastor. Um, I get to say, I now pronounce you man and wife, right? I have to preface it with, by the authority entrusted to I can't just say, Mark Jenkins, and nah. But why does the, the minister begin that announcement with, by the authority given to me by, I forget how it exactly goes. I didn't mess it up in your wedding, did I? Mark and Marcy, did I screw that part up? The, by the authority given to me by the, like, the state of Wisconsin and the church of, of Jesus Christ. Something like that, right? I say, by that authority given to me, I now pronounce you to be husband and wife. That's an authoritative announcement, revelation, that actually makes something happen. It makes you married. The Bible does something similar. It is God's authoritative announcement, authoritative word to us that is then recorded, and that's where the marriage license analogy would come into place, recorded so that we can go back again and again to it and see, yes, this is what God has authoritatively announced. The covenant has been made, and this is what he says about it. So the Bible is authoritative, and why can we say the Bible is authoritative? Well, we can say the Bible is authoritative because it is inspired. And when we talk about the Bible being inspired, what we mean, and I'm going to use a, a Bible phrase here, um, that I think is very interesting. We mean that it is God-breathed. God-breathed. Now, uh, younger folks, why would you think the Bible would 
describe itself as being God-breathed. What does that sound like it's saying? God breathed. Who's got an idea about that? Somebody's got an idea about that. It's not the way we speak, right? Like, hey, dad told you to, you got to go clean up your room. Are you serious? Yeah, dad breathed. (laughs) But you can kind of see where it comes from, right? Because when you talk, you're breathing out, right? It's a way of capturing the fact that your words are coming out of your your mouth. That's the idea anyway. So the Bible describes itself like that in 2 Timothy chapter chapter 3. In a letter that Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy, let me let me read this to you real quick. These are very uh, fa- this is a very famous common verse, of course. Many of you could recite it by heart. 2 Timothy 3, Paul says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All Scripture is breathed out by God. What he's saying then is that all of the Scripture is God's very word. It is breathed out by God. It's God's very word. But we have to recognize that the way God breathed it out was by using human people. The way God breathed it out was by using human people, okay? So this, uh, this is a, a, a very, I think, a very amazing thing about Scripture. It's a very amazing thing about the way God does a lot of things in this world. God can do things in a very direct manner. You know, think of creation, right? Let there be light by the power of his word. Boom, light comes into existence. So he can just announce and things happen. But he often speaks through messengers. And him speaking through messengers is no less his word. It's no less authoritative. Just as he can create directly by his power or he can heal someone's disease directly by his own touch as Christ did, or he can use what? Doctors and nurses. Is God healing through the means of doctors and nurses, not him healing? Is it less him healing? No, it's him healing 100%. Yeah, but the doctors and nurses were involved. Yeah, that's who he used. Right? Just if you watch Byron build a house, he's not going to usually pound the nails in directly with his fists. Sometimes you can catch him doing this when he's feeling extra brawny. But most of the time, he's going to use a hammer. And if you see Byron nailing, nailing a house together with a, with a hammer, you're not going to say, well, Byron says he built it, but it was clearly the hammer. He's building it. He's just using the hammer. That's how God has given us the Bible. It is God-breathed, but he has used humans to deliver that. So Paul says, check this out. I just kind of spoiled the the punchline there. We read in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's all what God says. But who wrote that? The Apostle Paul. The letter, and it is a letter from a human to humans. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promises of life, the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child. Paul is writing to Timothy, and yet Paul is writing to Timothy as, as he says, an apostle, an official representative. And so we see that Scripture is both the very word of God and the word of humans. But it's God using the word of humans such that what they write is their words and also every word that God wants them to write. It's the word of man and the word of God. It's the word of men writing their thoughts under the direction of God such that everything they write is exactly what he wants them to write. 
every single thing. And so this is called organic inspiration. Organic because God is using humans. And that's why when you read the Bible, there's different styles. When you read the Apostle Paul, he has a certain voice to him. He, he writes in a certain way, sometimes in a very aggravating way. Uh, Peter said, uh, in, in Second Peter, he said, yeah, the Apostle Paul, he writes things that can at times be hard to understand. So even Peter had trouble understanding everything that, that Paul wrote. John writes in his own kind of style. That's not us making things up. That, that's easy to recognize. When you read the book of Psalms. It's different in, in, in style than the, than the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is different than Isaiah. On and on we could go. There's a great diversity because so many different humans were used to, to, to write the Bible, but all of it is authoritative because all of it is God's word because every word that the humans wrote were the exact words God wanted them to write. It's all breathed out by God. And this means... This is the third characteristic. It's authoritative. It's inspired. Lastly, it's infallible, meaning it's incapable of conveying falsehood. It doesn't teach anything that is not absolutely true. Now, can we misunderstand it? Absolutely. Has the Bible been used to promote great falsehood? Absolutely. But the key there is to recognize when that happens, it's been misused. It's been misused. And the importance of recognizing this is in, 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 in seeing the fact that we can't approach something that is God's very word and start thinking, well, parts of it might be all messed up. Because the minute we start doing that, we're not reading it as God's word, are we? We're not. Because God happens to be in author an authority over us. If anything is God's word, it comes from him down to us. If we start approaching scripture like it's got mistakes, our judgment is coming down from us onto it. And you can start deciding whatever you want about it, which at which point it becomes no longer authoritative and no longer really a word from God. And you start making claims like, well, yeah, but it helps me access what God is, uh, what, what I think God is communicating to me. Because it's really, you know, I use the Bible, but it's also like the Bible in combination with like, you know, how he's speaking directly to my, to my, my soul and my experiences and my feelings. And, and here's what I think he's saying. And so, yeah, it's going to get some things wrong, but it, it doesn't get the main things wrong. Well, that's just a world of mess. That's a world of mess because you say, okay, if it got that wrong, what about that stuff about Jesus on the cross? No, I think that's right. Well, how do you know that's right if you think the other thing is wrong? If it's up to you to decide, then you're the one that ends up defining the relationship. You're the one that ends up defining the truth, not the one receiving the truth. And we do that because we want to be in charge. But think back to what we talked about regarding having the relationship with God be ambiguous. If we're in charge and our relationship with God is like left up to us, or we say, maybe I'm not in charge, God is in charge, but figuring out the truth is, is up to me, you, you're back in a quagmire of uncertainty. You're not able to really know what is definitely true about God and his relationship with you, about God and his love for you. So it might be tempting because it offers some freedom, but that freedom that it's offering is a lie. The fact that the Bible is absolutely authoritative over us, God giving it, not making mistakes, gives us a sure anchor for the soul. We can say, God has said, God has said, and he will not change his mind. And that gives us hope and that gives us security. This is so important because um, 
the next characteristic to, to, to recognize, and we'll hit this very fast. The Bible is Christ-centered and powerful. It's Christ-centered. What do I mean by that? I simply mean that the entirety of the Bible is the story of Jesus Christ. Now, is Jesus introduced by name back at the beginning? No, he's not introduced by name back at the beginning. But from the start of the story, from the start of the story, he's involved. And it's all leading up to Jesus. So we don't understand the Bible as being stuff before Jesus and therefore not about Jesus and then stuff after Jesus and therefore about Jesus. We understand it as stuff before Jesus, but about Jesus leading up to the part with Jesus, clearly about Jesus. It's all centered around Jesus and his great work. And this will become clear when we dig into the nature of the covenants that he has established with us, okay? Now, lastly, and we could spend, I mean, every single one of these points could be an entire lecture, right? Could be an entire teaching thing. I mean, the fact that it's Christ-centered, I would love to talk to you about, you know, that for weeks and prove it and show different ways that it all connects to Jesus. Just listen to reform preaching and you'll pick that up. But lastly, let's recognize that the Bible is sufficient and final and powerful. Those are really a couple things all rolled up into one. Sufficient. We don't need other avenues of revelation. So common in our day are people that say, yes, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, but God also speaks to me in these other ways. God also speaks to me in these other ways. We don't need that. The way the Bible talks about itself makes it clear that God has given us everything we need. All, the, all of his special revelation that we need, it's found in his word. And he says this by referencing the fact that the words of the apostles and prophets of the New Testament form the foundation of the church. The revelation given to them in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3, we read this, it forms the foundation of the church. And that analogy is very powerful, isn't it? Because once a foundation has been laid, and then you start building upon that, you don't keep pouring the foundation, do you? The Word of God, the revelation we need, has established the foundation of the church, and we are then built upon that. If you come along and say, yeah, the, the, the Word of God is good, but God keeps giving us more of this revelation, what you're doing is having concrete be poured into the second story, right? To the third story. You're, you're messing the whole structure up. You don't add concrete when you don't need concrete. That's right, Byron, right? He's gonna, he breaks up concrete with his fist. He knows, what he's, he knows what he's doing. So we rest in the fact that the Bible is the sufficient word of God and we rejoice in the fact that it is powerful. Let's close with this. This is God speaking. This is God speaking. God breathed. And as Paul said, it is useful for these things. In other words, he's saying it's God breathed and so stuff happens because of it. Stuff happens because of it. Think of examples of God breathing, God speaking in the Bible. We can think back to creation, right? What happens when God speaks? There's nothing, and then there's something. Let there be light, and boom, there's light. God speaking is a powerful thing, and so that's the nature of the Bible. When we read it, we receive it as revelation from God that is authoritative because he inspired men to write it, and we receive it as something that is making stuff happen. It's never a dead word. It always accomplishes God's purpose. And so we should approach it with great confidence, joy, and faith that he's going to use it. Let's pray. Great God, we do so thank you for your word and for revealing to us in your word 
the nature of our relationship with you that we look forward to exploring, the covenant that you have made with us, your people. We thank you, Lord, that in your grace you have chosen to do this and not left us as as sheep without a shepherd, have not left us as, as orphans, but you have married us. You've made us your your holy bride. You've established an official bond with us. We praise you and thank you for that and ask that you'd bless us as we continue in this class. In Jesus' name, amen.